Download the Progressive Radio Network app. Listen live or to the archives anytime. Until next time, we both hope you stay healthy. healthy. Peter R. Bregan, M.D., is called the conscience of psychiatry for his many decades of successful reform efforts. His scientific and educational work provide the foundation for modern criticism of drugs and ECT and lead the way in promoting more caring and effective therapies. His books include Talking Back to Prozac, Toxic Psychiatry, Medication Madness, Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, and now Guilt, Shame, and Anxiety, Understanding and Overcoming Negative Emotions. Welcome to the Dr. Peter Bregan Hour. Hello. Hello, hello. I think I cut in a little early on that, my (laughs) wonderful, wonderful audience. We're having a little tumult here as each show begins and we get adjusted to being a TV show. Although those of you who are hearing me right now are listening live on the radio. We also are TV and this is the fourth show on TV. And uh, you can get to the TV show just by going to Dr. Bregan's YouTube channel. That's the easiest way to get yourself there. Um, or you can find it off my website, off the drop-down menu and other places on the website. And uh, this is uh, 4 p.m. New York time, Wednesday, November 27th, Thanksgiving around the corner, even nearer than around the corner. I want to wish all of you the beginning of just a lovely season time for you. Whatever you celebrate, I hope you celebrate with joy, with happiness, with peace, with love, with reason, with all those wonderful God-given, nature-given abilities that we have to relate to each other. It's a, a wonderful time of the year to think about how can we make everything we say to everyone around us something that improves our relationship. It's one of the things I try to teach my clients who often are having lots of relationship issues, to say the least, or worse. And that is, see what happens during the next few weeks if everything you speak is aimed at enhancing the relationship with the other person. We just ate at the diner. I, pe- people who work at the diner, they flock around, not to talk to me, but to talk to Ginger, because she has that quality of improving the relationship, making that person relate in a happier way than they've maybe done all day, just having a few words with her. So keep that in mind. Keep it in mind with somebody who's near and dear to you, with whom you're having irritability and difficulty like we so often do. And and just say to yourself, all right, is what's about to come out of my mouth going to enhance the relationship? Never mind being right Never mind excusing yourself. Never mind making a point. Think about all your relationships in terms of communication, enhancing that relationship. It will change your life. And you'll just be more comfortable everywhere you go. You'll make more friends. And it won't stop you when needed from saying something of importance. It might even enable you to say more important things. But bring this into your your season. And, uh, and I think you'll have a really, really happy time. I've got three amazing people whom those of you who are watching us on TV will look at and say, these are interesting human beings. Uh, to my, to uh, my right is Bonnie Burstow. Bonnie is somebody I've I'm, known. I have to be to your left, Bergen. I don't know where it's going to be. I don't know. I don't know if that improved our relationship, though, when you corrected me. <laughs> um, Bonnie, Bonnie is a professor at the University of Toronto. Bonnie is a novelist. Bonnie is a poet. Bonnie is a philosopher and a psychologist and a scientist. She has written a wonderful, interesting book, a novel, story uh, about a person who's had ECT. And and I I might just ask her, uh, after I introduce everybody, to 
to begin talking a little bit about that. She's written some very uh, thoughtful, insightful, critical books about psychiatry. And she's done something amazing. She has an, created an endowed scholarship at the University of Toronto in, wait now, listen to this, the scholarship is in anti-psychiatry studies. Now, it takes superwoman, a genius, somebody protected by God to be able to <laughs> accomplish something like that. So, Bonnie, welcome Thank you. to the new radio TV hour. You've been on the radio hour before. Indeed. And thank you for going to all the trouble of figuring out how, how to uh, do this. Then the gentleman in the hat, Stephen Tickton, psychiatrist. I'm going to let him introduce himself a bit. Um, but I love that this man. I've known him for years and years and years. We, we first got to know each other in Great Britain. At, at a, a party at his house and uh, on a long train ride to visit, I think, J uh, Lucy Johnstone or go to a conference with her. Wasn't that what it was, Steve? Yes, it was uh, a conference out in Bristol. Yeah. Bristol, yeah. We took a train ride from London to Bristol. And it was, yeah. a, it was a pleasure meeting a psychiatrist with whom I could sit for a couple of hours <laughs> and have a good time and a nice time. It was, mu it was mutual, Peter. <laughs> That's, it's wonderful. And, and, and uh, he's a psychiatrist. All these folks are in Toronto, Canada, as far as I know. Yeah, very much so. And then Oriel, who is somewhat new to me, I've heard her name many times, Oriel Varga. Oriel is spelled O-R-I-E-L, is that right? That's right. And um, Oriel has a, 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 a law degree. Uh, she's not yet practicing. I think you're getting a PhD. Are you getting an anti-psychiatry PhD? She, she is. Oh, she anti-psychiatry PhD. <laughs> oh, my God. She certainly is, and she's also been one of the recipients of the scholarship in anti-psychiatry. Yes, I remember. Wow. Yeah. Well, well um, created a wonderful anti-psychiatry scholarship that is really making a difference for students. Uh, that's just wonderful. Um, tell, how is it making a difference? Tell me more. Well, it's supporting students who are interested in this area. And we're seeing scholarship uh, where there really is an absence and really is a need for people to interrogate and look at the harms of psychiatry. So it's drawing students to us, and it's it's really very powerful. Well, I, I'm very, very glad to hear that. Are you putting any emphasis on alternatives? Not that you have to. I'm not suggesting you do. Or is it strictly the critique? Uh, well, it, that is a question for the committee whose research they will support. But the scholarship itself is an anti-psychiatry scholarship. Mm -hmm. But critique is in there. I think Matt's study is in there. Uh, but it depends on what the uh, committee is going to support. So maybe Bonnie can answer. Us. <laughs> oh, no, no, you know, three. The, we divided the anti psychiatry scholarship this year three ways because there were so many good applicants. We 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 divided three ways. One of them was looking at a non psychiatric approach to trauma, and so definitely was looking at other things. One was looking at uh, how to keep, you know, the, the you know the the, the legal encroachments. So that's law, and 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 one was looking at how historically psychiatry developed, and you know the horrible things in psychiatry developed out of things like the Allen Memorial Institute. So one was doing a historical thesis. So one was definitely in 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 line at looking at terms. Two two were looking at something very different. So where's well, I think it's a, a really good thing to be looking at alternatives if we can, because it helps people. In a, in a sense, you you got both the black and the white. Then you can see the darkness better if you realize there are loving, caring, thoughtful, empathic approaches to helping people that work so much better than what uh, biologically oriented psychiatry is is now doing um, with its uh, damage and destructiveness. Uh, Bonnie, what uh, what have you run into along the way? I remember there was a moment where I felt like I had to come to your defense early on. I've been threatened. Uh, the, at one point, 
uh, somebody, uh, a, a neurology professor or something like that in Eastern Canada told me a whole bunch of them were getting together and were all going to be launching lawsuits against me. And that's when I got in touch with you. And you said, take it easy, Bonnie. It is not against the law to have a different medical opinion than they do. <laughs> 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 Which I then informed him. <laughs> but every, I also had death threats. I also have also had death threats, but you know, no one killed me. Yeah, it's astonishing how threatened uh, people get. Well, for one thing, you know, we're taking on so much more than psychiatry when you talk about anti-psychiatry. You're really talking about anti-psychopharmacological sure. empire. Sure. Because yeah. psychiatry yeah. is just the, the sales wing. That's right. And the That's justification, the fake research, and all the stuff that goes into that. But psychiatry is small potatoes compared to the whole pharmacological empire, not just the psychopharm, because they're all related. Right. They all have the same interests, and uh, <clears throat> being criticized is not one of those interests. Definitely not, and honest inquiry is not one. And, and I did have people, like, you know, they, they were meetings when I was forming the scholarship, there were meetings and conferences throughout Europe where everyone was talking about how to stop the scholarship from coming into existence. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so... One of the things I know is when you get people that upset, you're doing a good job. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Well, yes, you know, um, you know, when people accuse me of um, having a lot of enemies, I tell them I've earned every last every one of them. <laughs> they are probably correct in their assessment <laughs> of me. And I do believe in truth. Um, I think one thing that the four of us have in common that is not necessarily a common quality, um, and that is, I think we're more devoted to the truth than even our own safety. To, yes, we're devoted we to the truth even more than our professional advancement. It's like, in a sense, what we religiously are devoted to is speaking truth. Does that make sense? It, it yeah. does. It's yeah. what Gandhi talked about the power of the power of truth. Yes, Satya Graha. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Steve, let me let me invite you to uh, describe yeah. yourself a little more clearly in terms that I did not want to say because I thought people might not <laughs> might think I wasn't being respectful because of the kind of way you tease yourself and your self descriptions. Okay, well, I, I have a very unique way of describing myself, and actually, uh, very interestingly, the first time I met Ronnie Lang in England, and I came into his office, and I was dressed in a wraparound skirt, and a cowboy hat, and a poncho, <laughs> and, and he looked at me and he said, you seem to define yourself visually in a very unusual way. <laughs> so that's now, what Ronnie mean. Lang, folks, was, um, along with Thomas Sass, was among the earliest serious critics, <clears throat> though he didn't really go far out on a limb in many ways. He did support an alternative viewpoint that was existential, philosophical, a little quixotic at times, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but he wasn't, uh, he wasn't uh, writing the way this group of people do, uh, you know, explaining why we think psychiatry is so harmful to people, but it was implied in what he was doing. And, well, the, the person that really uh, wrote in a way, which I think is more uh, consistent with what we're doing here in Toronto with the uh, anti-psychiatry movement, was actually David Cooper, yeah, who, was, who was Lang's colleague. And David uh, once described himself to me as a Marxist Luxembourgist. Uh, so he was definitely, you know, um, on the left, to the left. And when I first met him, I said, what's the difference between you and Lang? And he said, I'm on a political trip and Lang is on a spiritual trip. And I think that's the difference. <clears throat> so David, 
Cooper was real, and unfortunately, uh, you know, there's a book by uh, Joel Covell um, called Social Amnesia, uh, where he talks about uh, how certain people get forgotten. And I think David Cooper is one of those people who's been forgotten. Uh, you can't find his books anywhere in the commercial and, bookshops. And, and, and yet he's the person who came up with the with the word anti-psychiatry. Yeah, yeah he's not the person anti who actually coined Lang the word anti-psychiatry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Lang and, and, and Cooper, unlike Lang, did talk about resistance from below. So you did have some of that similar yeah. stuff with Foucault yeah. had. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oreo, yeah. yeah. more about yourself. Well, I'm a community organizer, activist, uh, scholar, study who studied law. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've been involved in different uh, different community activists, anti-poverty organizations, and uh, more recently, the Coalition Against Psychiatric Assault. For a long time. So this is this is an organization that has been around for 15 years. And uh, is we've kind of created a hub or a center in Toronto uh, working on anti-psychiatry work and doing things like an annual uh, Stop Shocking Your Mothers and Grandmothers uh, demo against electroshock conferences, book launches, and um, more recently a library, which I hope we're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I asked for your address so I could send you some books, but I don't know if we've completed that cycle. Um, if nobody's brightening up, the cycle has not been completed. So I've got a, <laughs> to, to, maybe I never got an address. So send me an address well, for of it. Of course. I mean, we can, uh, we are doing a call. So this is a t called TAL, uh, Toronto's Anti-Psychiatry Lending Library. Uh, it's going to be the world's first anti-psychiatry library, so very exciting stuff, uh, and we do hope people are going to send their anti-psychiatry or MAD studies or critical psychiatry literature to us. Uh, and it can be both dropped off in person for people who are local and by mail. Uh, that I'm going to give the address, so it's at OISE, 252 Bloor Street West. You have to give uh, my name so, or the yeah, you're, you're, you're right. Yes, two, two. So Bonnie Burstow, care attention. Bonnie Burstow, Doctor Bonnie Burstow, at two fifty two Bloor Street West, Toronto, Ontario, M five S one V six. And uh, if people have questions, they can also contact Bonnie Burstow at bonnie at utoronto ca. But we really are inviting people to send their anti-psychiatry and critical mad studies work to us because we're hoping to launch this in the spring and we obviously rely on people's donations. Uh, but this is a very exciting initiative because one of the really difficult things for students and community is really to get information about the harms of psychiatry, to get the anti-psychiatry literature together in one place. And of course, books are very expensive, so this will be a resource for people. I think it might be interesting for people to um, hear about how each of you got involved in this area. Who wants to go first with that one? I'll, I'll go first, Peter. I'll go first. So I got into this area in a very circuitously, uh, kind of a circuitous route. Um, I started off as a medical student uh, quickly found I had no interest in the bi biological sciences, dropped out of medicine, changed to philosophy, did a BA and MA in philosophy at, at University of Toronto, and then under the tutelage of two amazing professors, one was a Professor Charles Hanley, who was both a philosopher and a training psychoanalyst, and the other is one of your great uh, 20th century American intellectuals, his name was Lewis Samuel Foyer. He taught in the sociology department here at the University of Toronto. Uh, and they both encouraged me to go back to medical school with the aim of becoming a psychoanalyst. So that was, that's what I, how I started out. And then 
uh, I happened to bump into a fellow philosophy student one day, and he said, what's this I hear that you've changed from philosophy to medicine? And I said, yeah, I want to become a psychoanalyst. And I was told that the best way to do that is to go back, finish my medical school, and then apply to the Toronto Institute of Psychoanalysis. So he got very angry with me. And he said, don't you realize what R.D. Lang meant by the politics of experience? And at that time, I'd never read Lang or Cooper or anything to do with anti-psychiatry. So he left me very curious. And uh, that's how I started reading Lang. And by the time I finished medical school, I had no desire to become a psychoanalyst. I wanted to go over to England and study with Lang and Cooper. <laughs> So that's kind of how I got into it. So you were at the real heart of the beginning in Great Britain of yeah. the movement, yeah. which the intellectual side of it. Well, I yeah. guess it begins in both places. It begins with Cooper and Lang and then and yeah. the Zoss in it's this Zoss, country. And then I Zoss. come in pretty quickly after that and yeah. Bonnie in Toronto. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I... Uh, uh, I began with an automatic suspicion of psychiatry because I have a father who was subjected to 200 electroshock treatments. Mm -hmm. That will do it for you. Mm -hmm. you. You either see through it or you don't, and I very definitely saw through it. Um, then I, uh, I went on and took training as a, as, as a psychologist, and at one point uh, I was working in a in a hospital, and I noticed, uh, and not in a, in, you know, as a what used to be called local initiative project worker. It was, uh, it was one of those strange things that happened in the '60s, and I, and I was pretty sure that they had killed, uh, they had drugged a person to death, and then declared, shipped them, and declared them dead at arrival in another hospital, uh, in a psychiatric institution, and they had missed, they, they, and. And so I, uh, I, uh, I, perpet I, I, I got hold of the hospital files and leaked them to, uh, to, uh, to the politicians. And something got started called the Aldo Aldiani affair, where they did a, a huge investigation into his death and how did this have, how could this have happened? And from then on, I never looked back. Then I joined um, Phoenix Rising Collective. Uh, uh, and I started writing stuff. In the meantime, I was I was taking training as a psychologist, and I was a totally critical person who was uh, who was throwing out a good part of what I was uh, studying, but very much reframing it. And uh, from uh, you know from the er very early eighties on, I was spending a huge part of it every day in anti psychiatry efforts. So. It was it, it 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 was always there, but it got bigger and bigger and bigger as as I went along, and, and then I started writing a lot of books and a lot of articles. Do you think you could have um, had a successful career in the United States with your critical views and been at a university uh, equivalent to Toronto, which is a very good school? I don't really know. Uh, you know, uh, when when I initially was trying to get into, you know, I, I've taught in various schools of social work, uh, but when I was originally trying to get into the school of social work at University of Toronto, I used to get rejections by return mail. I mean, they were horrified that this anti-psychiatry person. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got a job in a department that's called the uh, Department of Adult Education and Counseling Psychology. And it was the adult education people uh, who, who, uh, for whom this was non-problematic, and the psychology people said, "Well, we need to stretch ourselves." But would I have been hired in a more conventional uh, department? I don't know. I don't know at all. Uh, but I didn't have to find that out. Uh, when I got hired in social work at Carleton University, uh, the uh, the, uh, the the um, Association of Social Workers for Ontario threatened to delist Carlton if they went ahead with the hiring. So that's how threatening my anti-psychiatry politics was to professionals. Yeah. Yeah, it's really quite ter uh, terrifying. Or what, uh, this is Oriel Varga, 
again, I should introduce people sitting sitting next to Steve Tickton <laughs> and Bonnie Burstow. So Burstow. the way that I started out was really I wanted to become a psychologist. There you go. Uh, so I want to go all the way, get a PhD in psychology. <laughs> uh, that's how I started. Um, and by about the second year, <laughs> I already got a sense that something was very amiss. And I did something which... Both Bonnie has done in Psychiatry in the Business of Madness and yourself, Peter, as well, is to look at what it is. What, so they're saying it's a, uh, a medical illness. Um, these so-called mental illnesses are a medical illness. Where is the proof? And I went and I read tons and tons of articles and I couldn't find I got more and more frustrated. I wanted to move over to, psych, to um, philosophy at that point, but I would have had to have done an extra year. So I ended up doing sociology. And the way I understood myself was doing a sociology of psychology. <laughs> uh, so that's how it started. And then I ended up um, uh, doing, um, being involved in various activist things. And I, for example, was involved in creating a free University of Toronto uh, at the University of Toronto, which is very expensive. Uh, and part of that, we had courses somewhere between 25 to 50 courses at any given time. Um, uh, all free and uh, you know some of those courses were really very interesting including an anti-psychiatry course and it was just a really okay. great and awesome thing to see Don Weiss's anti-psychiatry course running at the same time as the traditional psychology <laughs> courses which I knew too well <laughs> and basically across the hall and then watching students from the uh, general psychology class basically uh, going into the anti-psychiatry <laughs> class. <laughs> that was the best. <laughs> anyway, so and then I was I did get involved in Kappa and was in, uh, you know involved for the last number of years, and um, also articled in so-called mental health law. So that gave me kind of a bit of a inside view on, you know, sort of pulling the curtain curtain back a little bit to see what is happening. Uh, on the inside and through documentation and um, and um, yeah, the consent and capacity board and involuntary confinement and taking away people's capacity and all that. So that's so I've been, I, I you know there was a I felt a real need to be part of the uh, movement and the organizing when I was articling in me so-called mental health law uh, because then. You know, this this seemed to be lacking in the kind of discussions and conversations. Where are the psychiatric survivors organizing around the harms that the psychiatry caused? So I reconnected with Kappa at that point. <laughs> well, having a medic, uh, I keep wanting to call it a medical degree. Having a law degree, uh, what made you decide to go ahead and get a PhD uh -huh. in? A field so full of opportunity as anti-psychiatry. <laughs> well, I think I think maybe the answer the answer has to do partially with my interest in community legal clinics, and in the organizing side, which the clinics have historically the legal clinics historically have had a model of community-based lawyering, and a recent shift to merge clinics. So I saw as a law student, I was horrified to find that there was a new model rather than a grassroots community-based model of lawyering. There was a shift to very hierarchical, top-down, uh, and also discussion by the mental health uh, strategy, Legal Aid on Terror, that's the funders, strategy to work with hospitals, to work with, and this was part of the merger proposal, basically, to work in interdisciplinary teams with hospitals and there's pilot projects going on right now as well to work bring the clinics into the hospitals but there seemed to be this lack of connection with uh the grassroots organizing and with psychiatric survivors that maybe in the you know previous decades there would have been much more alliance rather than with institutions that you know involuntarily um detain people and that harm people to basically be working with <coughs> the psychiatric survivors from the grassroots so that that was an interest for me to, um, as a lawyer, or potentially, right now I'm not practicing, but as a lawyer to reconnect with community-based lawyering that works with, for example, with psychiatric survivors or with low-income people to organize a resistance and to, you know, look at the law as well and to address legal issues. <clears throat> now, Bonnie, I, I didn't realize, actually, I think until today, and I should have known it, 
that you are a psychotherapist. I was thought of you I've been a therapist as a, for decades and decades. Which yeah, is how as an intellectual and yeah. academic. Which is so, how I... And I know Steve does psychotherapy, so I'd like to hear what sort of psychotherapy you do, if you could describe it. Very difficult to describe, but uh, but uh, I, uh, for instance, I talk about that I do count, I, I, I do, certainly there's an existential component in what I do, because I do think relationship is key, and I do think joining with people is key. There's also a more overt political component, where, uh, where, uh, I, I, uh, where I, I try to help people uh, 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 instead of seeing all the problems as inside themselves, start seeing the, how the problems are created outside of themselves that they are caught up in and be able to act against them, which then gives them a certain way of being powerful in the world rather than being a patient. Mm -hmm. right? So I, I combine the political with the philosophic with the, with the existential. And I'm a, I, and I guess, and, and as you know, I'm a feminist therapist. So I, I see gender as very critical. I see race as very critical. Uh, but you know, at the bottom of it all, I don't think anyone's being treated like a human being. I didn't hear your last words. At the bottom of it all, I don't think anyone in the system is being treated like a human being. So the existential is paramount. Yeah. Well, I. I... I think that's so. Um, I think I take it more as the world is always, as much as I work to to improve it, that we can't wait for change to enjoy our lives. I, just, I don't know whether whether you view that in the same way or not. I, I, I think we have to enjoy our lives, but I think there, I think in working for change, that also can be a joy enjoyment. You know, oh sure. The, you know the, when we take I mean, a lot of times it hasn't been for me, but it can be. Yes. <laughs> when we take upon ourselves the agency to name the world in order to change the world, I think we feel better. Yeah, there. that's a real puzzle to me because um, I don't see very many people who want to do what we do. Yeah, that and, puzzles me. <laughs> and um, I probably have. My my political view is probably more 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 outside the therapy perhaps than yours, and of course my politics are very are in some ways very very different since I I tend to be more of a libertarian conservative rather than a libertarian left. I used to be a libertarian yeah. left, and I became more libertarian well, conservative. Well, well, libertarian aspect to us, yes. <laughs> um, but um, I noticed that in in helping clients that changing the world almost never spontaneously comes up. And um, so I, in my experience, it's not much a part of the therapy that I do um, because it, it just doesn't seem to be what uh, almost everybody in the population wants to do with their lives. They want to have families, they want to earn a living, they, they want to make a contribution but they don't want to risk their identities, which is the work that uh, yeah. all of us do. We, our identities are kind of at stake in it. And it's, it's, almost none of the people I work with have ever gone on to be reformers. Uh, maybe see, one possible exception. What, what, Bonnie? Lots of people I work with have, though. You know, this is interesting. I, I would think so from what you were saying about your approach, yeah. Yeah, lots of people I work with have. And they don't, and they, they don't begin that way, but they but they often end up that way. And I've worked with a lot of people who have been uh, incarcerated, not in only psychiatric, but otherwise incarcerated. Who uh, once they get a political analysis, uh, there's a mo there's a motivating force on what they want to do with their lives. They actually want to see justice in the world for themselves, for people they've they've come across. So it can actually be very very. Now, is that everyone? No, but. It's a lot of people. So, you know, I would say of my clients, uh, uh, it's a factor in, in about 50% of them. Anyway. It's probably a different group of people in part, but I think it's also um, just how we think about things. It's interesting to try to talk about something this subtle and potentially volatile. Because it's such a, it gets so so into politics. But I've been I've been struck. Most of the people that I know who know me well, 
use me as an example of how they don't want to live. <laughs> they don't want to take the risks. My clients see me on television taking on some issue and they say, God bless you. But they don't seem to have any inclination to, uh, to go through the kinds of stresses and identity threats and life threats. I mean, you've had all of that. Uh, that comes uh, from doing the work I do. So it's it's interesting. When I just pay attention to what they seem to want to want, they don't seem to want to want a critical analysis of society and to take it on. It's interesting. Yeah. But, yeah. but say more, and even uh, you know, because it's it's, it's it seems some very important somehow I, I, and I, I, puzzling. I want the world to be in sync with their ideas, though. So if they're seeing that the world is not the way things are structured is humiliating and harming people, I think that there's a kind of a a push towards no, we need to make this change. You, well, you that's know, what I'm wondering know. about because I don't see a lot of people thinking that way. I know. Right. I have friends who are very socially critical, but they're much more interested in taking care of their mothers and their fathers yeah. and their children and maybe doing a little something for the local community. I think maybe it's partly different circles we move in. It may, it may be different circles. Yeah. I, I, I'm noticing, you, you know, I, I, I teach this uh, very radical counter hegemonic trauma course, and everyone walks away from the course wanting to change the world desperately. You know? Uh -huh. It's a, great course. Huh? You know, it's a great course. It's a fantastic course. Yeah. You know, Peter. Uh, and I too walk away wanting to change the world. <laughs> Peter, in uh, in the seventies, there was a, a group in London that was called Red Therapy, and uh, and the idea there was that people would go into therapy to become better revolutionaries. Right. Okay. That was red therapy. Just lost. Uh, yeah. I think that Ronnie Lang came up with a great thing. He said, the treatment is how you treat the other person. And that's the main thing, how you treat the other person. And you treat the other person with respect and dignity. You don't look at them as a psychiatric case. Mm. You don't look at them as some kind of, you know, example of mental illness. You're 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 having an encounter with another human being, mm -hmm. and um, and for me, I mean, Robert Whitaker, I think in his book *Mad in America*, he talks about how um, the whole history um, of how psychiatry developed in America. There was something that used to be called moral therapy, therapy. Yes. and 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 basically this was treating the other person with respect and dignity. Well, it was in a Christian that, setting. That wasn't that good? Moral therapy. Really. <laughs> what was that? Don, what, what, what was done under moral therapy was often disgusting. <laughs> um, like moral therapy, folks. Was, uh, basically, it. So my understanding it came out of the Quakers in particular, yeah. And the Quakers, of course, uh, have a, their lives are just per pervaded with the spirit of God. One of my favorite sayings is a uh, is a Quaker saying to to greet that of God in other people, yeah. which is very similar to what Steve Tickton, the psychiatrist, was just saying. And I think. Um, but they, they brought to bear on it, um, perhaps as you do, Bonnie, their own viewpoint. And most of, the, I think, the people who came to them were Quakers. So they brought a very Christian moral viewpoint, and, and uh, but not a harsh one. And the Quakers don't have a harsh one, generally speaking. It, it, it and uh, That were good, and it had moments that were not good in, in, the, in, in the retreats they did, yeah. I mean, they, what they, moments were not good uh, uh, they, they in, in terms of what you're they thinking of? Up, they did have people. They, you know, now, now most of the, you know, it, it was a mixed bag. It was a mixed bag. And it depends. I, I think there were three major figures, and I can't remember them in the Quakers in the early days. And, and some of them were much more harsh and elderly, elder, the elder in the, in the lecturing at people. Size all of elder. Right. I imagine they would have done a fair amount. That the Took family is the one that I'm more familiar with, and 
I mean, one of their books talks about training the hospital aides to be kind, nonviolent, gentle. I mean, we don't no. do that now. I mean, no. No. the aides don't even get your basic <laughs> nonviolent communication courses. That's, they that's get takedown thought. training. And, yeah. and compare, compared to the other stuff that was happening at the time, it was good. There's no question. But but you can actually find some nuts and lace stuff that the Tukes also did. You know, so it, was, it was a very mixed bag, but but much better than the other stuff that was going on. There's no question. And, uh, and you know, if it wasn't that Quakers and religious people excelled in it, it might have it taken over. But there was no way the medical profession wanted something that other people were better at. And other people were better at retreats where you can go to the country and, and enjoy yourself. Yeah. What about the way you do therapy, Steve? Uh, well, again, uh, my approach is, is very much informed by existential philosophy, um, the, the work in existential therapy, uh, particularly Ronnie Lang. Uh, I mean, Lang uh, pointed out that the word therapy uh, comes from the Greek therapeia, which means to attend to someone. So for me, it's about attending to the other person without psychiatrizing them, uh, without medicalizing their problems, but seeing their problems basically, um, well, in the same sense that Thomas Sass said that, uh, how did he put it, Peter? Um, you know, uh, he had conversations with yeah, conversations. People. He had conversations with people about human problems. <laughs> Folks, you you can't imagine how radical it was to uh, be a psychiatric resident and yeah. Thomas Sass was saying, um, it's conversation. <laughs> you know, how can anybody own it or whatever? You don't need to, you don't need a, a, a four-year training program to know how to converse. <laughs> I don't know. You, know, you need a D training program. You need a deprogramming program after uh, after medical school. Um, well, this is very interesting to me. I, I um, you know, I'm very familiar with the. Well, I'll go back all the way to back in the '60s. I had a friend who um, was a um, feminist therapist. And she was a gay woman, and she she talked about how all almost all the women she saw would would convert to being gay. And I remember thinking at the time, well, there's something amiss there. And um, yeah. you know, in my work, I'm thinking I think I'm thinking so much more about. Well, how are you doing with your wife and your husband or your kids? Are you doing the work you want to do? Um, do you feel fulfilled? Um, what What do you What do you love to do the most, and why don't you do more of it? And um, And when do you get crazy or psychotic and start seeing things? Well, I notice it in the office, and what's going on? And you know, how can we help help get you more grounded in having loving relationships? And I'm so focused on that and that I'm not, I'm letting them decide whether they want to, to look into the political structure of it all. Because I think part of what I'm doing is working with the eternal structure. I've never said this before. The eternal structure of the family, of personal relationships and if you read my book, Guilt, Shame, and Anxiety, the setting is evolution rather than politics. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is how I think when I'm helping people. I'm very political in my thinking. I've written a book called Wow, I'm an American that I cost don't. me just about everybody I knew in New York City, <laughs> including my agent. Um, but uh, my, 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 my agent said, I'm not going to handle that book. I don't get up in the morning thinking, wow, I'm an American. I get up being ashamed of being an American. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, I know a lot about the politics and I know a lot about the various viewpoints and I've been involved in, in all of that. But somehow when I sit down with my neighbor, my friend, 
one of the people who works with me or for me and they want to talk about some trouble they have or somebody's paying me and coming to see me. It's like, I don't, I'm not thinking that way. I'm, I'm thinking about in a way that I think would have applied 100 years ago or 500 years ago or in the, fa- in the extended family as we were out uh, scavenging for food or fighting mammoths. I'm thinking about our personal relationships. And to me, I guess this is very interesting to me is this is exploratory thinking for me as I'm thinking of the differences. I, I'm thinking in a way that is, is down to the basics of our most immediate personal relationships. And um, I might on occasion say something where I think of uh, politics pertain, but... Um, I, I don't see them as that separate. I mean, I think that uh, Fasm is, is quite right that the personal is political. Eventually it is, to the degree the person wants to so be if, if this interested in that. Is in fact with a father who sexually abused them, uh, that's, uh, that's highly political and, and, and highly calm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and that's one area where I would definitely be talking about, I might even say patriarchy, or I might, but I would definitely be talking about the male abuse of women and children. I taught a course on the male abuse of women and children for a number of years at, in Mason. the Conflict Resolution Department Graduate School with George yeah. Mason. And um, there, I would I would see in the in the relations of men and women a very direct, immediate impact on on um, and children on Absolutely. on them of the of this very long historic phenomena of of patriarchy and male abuse. Um, so, so, wouldn't spend a lot of time on it, but I might tell them books I'd read or, or whatever. Um, to me, so much of the time, it it comes down to whether you can find love in your world. Um, I'm going to have a paper coming out soon on um, looking at oh my last talk when 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 I couldn't get connected with my guests <laughs> last week. I gave a talk on on. Um, how I think that underlying most of what we call madness all the way up to ordinary daily living issues is strongly related to our feeling that we are not worthy of love. We feel unworthy of love, that this is this is kind of a rock bottom experience and maybe taking a little advantage of you, having you here as my captive, more or less, maybe I'm your captive <laughs> audience. Um, what do you think about that? I've been thinking more and more that so much of what harms us is the feeling that we are unworthy of love. And of course, that has a huge political context to it, of which exactly. psychiatry is one of the more horrible I think and destructive. A lot of, I think a lot of people feel that way. You know, so I, so I think it's very, very common. I yes. should say that I almost never feel that way. So... Uh, and I'm always, and I'm much more likely to be shocked and, and wondering why is it people, uh, why is it people don't notice how lovable I am because I'm very lovable. So I'm, I'm not likely to go there, but some people. Well, that's a gift that you have. I wonder, do you know where you, did you give, give yourself that gift? Did you get it from your family? I don't think I got it from my family, but I think I, I uh, early on in my life, I really, I really, let myself know somewhere that just like I had to be on everyone else's side, I had to be on my side too. You know? Well, that's wonderful. But also the feeling of being loved has something directly to do with the political realities, right? So the racism in our society, the homophobia in our society, the patriarchy, the classism, you know, this is like in a very real material way impacts our feeling of love whether we are shunned at work or whether we are in our relationship with our fee, uh, our peers or whether we're pleased, the community is being pleased or, you know, like that impacts our personal feeling of love, the systemic issues. So I, I, I find it difficult to not see it that way. Well, I understand that. You're very different people, you and Peter. <laughs> and it is a bit different than my own way. Um, I think of my heroes 
and I would say this in, in, in my practice to people, I say, well, some of my heroes are Martin Luther King and yes. Nelson Mandela. Most of my heroes are African-American, interestingly enough, um, and, were, and have been for forever. And one of the things about those, all the people that I think of, um, uh, Harriet Tubman, um, they are um, uh, Douglas from, from you know, the escaped slave, um, that all of those people loved despite the world they were in. And that is what I most admire about them. Uh, um, uh, Gandhi was the same way. Uh, you know, for him, doing a sit-in was a form of love. You know, you presented yourself as an opportunity for people to change. <laughs> um, and so for me, my emphasis with folks would be, it doesn't... Uh, and by the way, there's an increasing number of African Americans now taking this public position that we have to be who we are take your eyes off racism and make yourself the person you want to be, the person you want to be, and fight racism where it is and, and, and do something about it. But don't let the world stop you from being loving. And of course, that's, that's Jesus's message. It's probably hidden somewhere in Judaism. I'm Jewish, but it's a little harder to find. <laughs> it's a little harder to find. So I would be using those examples as my heroes as people who to the to the moment they were killed were a couple of them um were loving under the most horrendous conditions slavery racism living on the edge of death the, the uh, mandela in prison for I can never remember the number of years because it seems impossible. It's up around 30 or something. Yeah. And and he makes friends with the, the the prison warden and he makes friends with the guards. And then they when they get ready, uh, they, they're going to release him provided he won't do any more any political work when he leaves. And he's a man of honor and he says, I'm not leaving. Mm -hmm. I'm not leaving under conditions from you. So he doesn't even do what I would yeah. intend to do, which is say, okay, and go out and do it anyway. And you know, run and hide or whatever. But to, to maintain the loving place in whatever period of history you are, whatever time you're in, whatever oppression you're in, that is much more my political lesson. And then let me, let me hear back. <laughs> I, I, I think it's one, one really important mention. Uh, I don't think it's the only important mention. You know, uh, if I can look at I contrast myself with Dawn. Uh, we, we, we both have been struggling for anti, for anti psychiatry for a long time. And, uh, and I almost never get angry. He's always angry. Always <laughs> angry. It works for him. It totally works for him. The noble rage works for him and it gives him a good life. You know? So I, so I, do, I think, I, I, I think uh, 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 rage is also a way that one can go for some people and it works very well. Well, I did it for 20 years, but it wore me out. I <laughs> finally asked God to so take Dawn's it. Dawn's about the same age you are. It hasn't wore him up. You know? what, what? Dawn's about the same age you are. They're both, you're, you're both the same age. It hasn't worn him up. I think everybody's different in, in what... He's younger than I am. By about, what, six months? <laughs> <laughs> He's older than you, Peter. He's... <laughs> he, he's mid to late 80s, so he can't be much younger. <laughs> no, you're, you're right. You're certainly right. I think he is older than me by a little bit. By a little um, bit. So, so I think different things work for different people. Like, um, uh, And and uh, do I think anyone can manage without any love in their life? No, I don't think so. Do I think that people are in trouble without some degree of anger? Yes, I think they are. <laughs> And then well, anger is a very good signal to protect ourselves, which is my own view of it. It's not a terribly effective way of making change. You, um, it's a, it's a way of saying I'm injured. I just got so angry. I realize I'm injured now. What do I need to actually push that person away or hurt that person, get that person away, or not, or or that thing, or that object, or that, you know, politician or whatever. Yeah. Well, I, I. Uh, 
Yeah, it's interesting. There are different nuances. And, um, I'm in a lawsuit right now that I can't, I'm not going to talk about, but uh, I'm in a lawsuit because I've charged a, a institution or something, and I'm in very good relationships with people who I've charged. So I like the fact that I can be kind to them and I can be. So yes. I just know what you're talking about. I think it's better for our digestion to be kind to the people <laughs> we're in conflict with. <laughs> I think also being a loving person and desiring a loving world is des desiring a whole world, one where one doesn't see these kind of devastating abuses. Yes. Okay? So working on, towards changing that, I think, is very seems very natural to me, and in any case. Yes. It doesn't necessarily well, it always has seemed natural to me, too. Anger, right? Yeah. It can come from a place of love, really. That works. Though sometimes anger, like Bonnie said, is important. Because yeah. if, you're, if you're injured, if you've been traumatized, it seems to be a natural response to be angry towards it. But it doesn't necessarily mean you create a less loving world if you're working on making changes that are to the positive. I, I, I remember the early days of Ontario Coalition to Stop Electroshock, way, way long ago. And I, uh, and, uh, I was also always alert to what was angering Dawn the most, because whatever was angering Dawn the most, we'd have ten times the energy to get something done with. <laughs> so it why, sense. why didn't you tell the folks who Dawn is a little bit more? Okay. So Dawn Whites is a combination of many things. He's uh, he's a psychiatric survivor who's been struggling for psychiatric survivor rights uh, nonstop, decade after decade after decade. A little known fact about him, he was also once a psychologist who worked in the belly of the beast, right? Uh, but he We are, by the way, I'm seeing we're going to be ending very soon. Um, why don't the, each of you... Um, Oreo Varga, start first and say a little something goodbye. Oh, well, um, maybe I should just tell people again that we're working on really interesting and amazing things here in Toronto and creating a library and uh, a book launch shortly in January for the upcoming book. Peter's in it. Bonnie's upcoming book. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're. And doing Bonnie's upcoming book is. Uh, Go ahead, tell the, me. The Revolt Against yes. Psychiatry. <laughs> a counter-hegemonic dialogue, and the second of the dialogues is with Peter Bruggen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting book. <laughs> and I wrote something very loving and appreciative toward you, which I think kept stayed in the book, didn't it? It yeah. certainly did. I wasn't going to let that go. <laughs> <laughs> God bless, Peter. <laughs> well, you and, and, and Bonnie, uh, well, uh, 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 Steve Tickton, yeah. T I C K T I N. Steve. Yeah, Tipton. it was originally Polish. It was T I K T I N. Uh -huh. And then when my ancestors came over to North America, they put a C N to anglicize it. <laughs> well, it's successful. Tick it ten. sounds more anglicized. Yeah. Any any ending thoughts? What do you think about the place of love in life? Well, I I was. I was just going to sing you uh, an ending song by Leonard Cohen called I loved you in the morning, your kisses sweet and warm, your hair upon the pillow like a sleepy golden storm. Yes, many love before us. I know that we are not new in city and in forest. They've smiled like me and you, but let's not talk of love and chains and things we can't untie our eyes are soft with sorrow hey that's hey that's no way to say goodbye <laughs> another canadian a jewish canadian <laughs> leonard cohen that was lovely i think it's the finest ending we've ever had to the dr peter <laughs> thank Greg you. An hour thank you my three friends <laughs> I think uh, we're going to hear the music soon. I don't know where it is. I hear it. Come on, music. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much, Ola. Pleasure, Peter. <laughs>